and please allow me to introduce him. Pete is a senior, a senior engineer here at WatchGuard and uh, is based in Australia. Pete spends lots of time with our partners and customers um, every day, and uh, he also has close ties to our product and technical team who are based in the US. This means um, that Pete has a deep technical knowledge of all of the WatchGuard pro uh, product portfolio, including the architecture, uh, best practice configuration, and, and also how our products integrate with other technologies in the market. Today, Pete's going to do a deep dive into the WatchGuard Cloud Wi-Fi solution, um, in particular the Discover tool and our wireless intrusion prevention system, or, or WIPs. There's a few things that uh, extra things Pete's going to cover in, ter in terms of a trusted wireless environment as well. So he has lots to cover. So I'm going to hand over to him and allow him to get started. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoy the session and, and don't forget to ask lots of questions. Okay, Pete, over to you. Thanks very much, Paul. You can hear me okay, can you? Yeah. Beautiful. So welcome everybody to the next wireless masterclass that we have decided to run. We ran one a little while ago now, which is available on our ANZ events page if you want to go back and look at historical recordings. But what we wanted to do now as we've released some new wireless pricing into the market was kind of recap the value of the WatchGuard wireless ecosystem. So we're going to talk today about a few different things, but this is a technical masterclass. So the assumption is that the audience is technical because we are going to show you how to configure this plaque this platform to get the best out of it. So what we're going to cover today is the difference between your basic secure and your total Wi-Fi SKUs. Just like our firewalls, we sell these access points with a different uh, licensing structure on each of them. We're going to talk about some of the differences between AP125s, 325s and 420s, prime they're the most common business access points we have. And then we'll talk about the six major Wi-Fi threats that our WIPs or our wireless intrusion prevention system is really there to kind of mitigate. A lot of people are very used to firewall threats, but they don't really understand, you know, how easy it is to attack a corporation's wireless. So we'll cover off those as well. Then we'll get into the, the meat of what we're going to do today and sort of show you how you can use some of our documentation, which is absolutely fantastic documentation to configure up a, a trusted wireless environment. We've really streamlined how you can turn these features on and made it a lot easier. And then we're going to talk about how you can use WatchGuard Discover to troubleshoot wireless issues. When you're deploying wireless, it's never as simple as just turning it on, broadcasting an SSID and walking away. You do need to understand some basic radio principles and Discover is really you know, designed to be able to help you to remotely diagnose Wi-Fi, you know, performance issues. Do you have enough access points? Do you have too little access points? Do you have the right access point placement and these kinds of things? So we'll talk about that as well. And then we'll talk about WIPS overlay. WIPS overlay is the ability to take a WatchGuard access point, one of our smallest access points, our WatchGuard AP125, and configure this in a specific mode where it protects other vendors' Wi-Fi networks. So the great example of this is if you've sold Wi-Fi into some of your customers or you've just purchased a new Wi-Fi solution, and then you like what you see with the WatchGuard wireless intrusion prevention system, you don't have to completely replace your wireless environment. You can use some of these small access points to augment your current wireless environment and get that security. So when we look at the WatchGuard access point range, I'll pick up this AP125 again, and I'll pick up the AP420. Straight away, you're going to notice that they are very different in their size and their format. And really, that's really got to do with what is inside them. The AP125 is a pretty basic two radio access point designed for small Wi-Fi networks with not a heap of clients on them. It does what you need it to do, and it's a great little unit. But the upper end of the scale is the AP420, a much bigger device. It has you know, 11 antennas, and this is sort of for your conference room centers. These are, uh, you wanna have a lot of clients connected to a single access point. You need a bigger access point with more antennas, obviously. So our range of access points that we have, we have the WatchGuard AP125. And if you look at my screen at the moment, you'll see we've kind of graphed it out with, you know, very easy to understand. It's not, you know, it's not at the top end of the speed and it's not utilised for heaps of people. We then move up to, you know, in terms of the corporate access points, the AP325. 
This is a much faster access point, and it's our medium density access point. So it's got two MU MIMO uh, capabilities. It's uh, and, and it's a three radio access point. So the primary difference between your AP125 and your AP325 is that the 325 has an additional radio in it. And that radio can be used as what we call a dedicated WIPs radio. If you had an environment that was just AP125s, you'd have to sell a few extra AP125s to be that additional WIPs radio. Whereas the AP325, and the 420 has three radios in it. So each access point is also a WIP sensor. And we'll tell you more about what a WIP sensor is later. We also have our WatchGuard AP225W. This is a wall plate access point, great for sort of hotel deployments, school deployments, where you need to, it just fits in a, a sort of GPO outlet in, in, a, um, in a normal wall. And then you can obviously use that in a lot more classrooms or, or hotel rooms. We have an outdoor access point, which is our AP327X. This access point takes um, external antennas you need to purchase the antennas depending on your deployment scenario. You might want to use directional antennas, you know, omnidirectional antennas. So basically you need to work out how that outdoor access point is going to be deployed. If it's up high, you might need directional antennas or if it's just in a, an area that weathers, you still might want omnidirectional antennas. And then we have our 420 and you'll notice that the icons down the bottom for the 420 is, you know, that's the fastest access point we have and the highest density access point we have as well. So these are all sold with the same licenses. It's just that they have some slightly different feature sets. Remember, the AP125 is a two radio AP and all the most of the others are a three radio AP. If we look a little bit deeper into, you know, kind of what they have, really, you know, when we talk about adding additional people, you need additional antennas. So the AP125 has four internal antennas, which is the same as the 225W. Moving up to the AP325, it can cater for more people. So it's actually got six internal antennas. And then you go all the way up to the AP420 when you realize that it's got 10 an internal antennas, you'll notice that that's one of the reasons why it is so large. The other reason is really the, the maximum data rate. So some of these access points, uh, they have a different data rate, whether they're, um, you know, the amount of multiple MU MIMO um, systems they can handle. So the maximum data rate on the AP125, for instance, is 860 megabits per second, whereas the theoretical maximum data rate for the AP uh, 420 is 1.7 gigabits per second. Now, a lot of the time I get questions around speed and performance with wireless. WatchGuard has what we call our Wi-Fi deployment guide, which if you're an engineer and you're tasked with deploying wireless, it's a big document, but I would very much recommend you to read, read it cover to cover. There is no easy answer to how many people can this AP connect and how fast is that AP? It essentially really de depends on where the access point's located, how much interference there is, how much additional sort of usage of the 2.4 of the 5 gig uh, spectrum there is. So when people ask us at WatchGuard, how many people can this AP handle, there's a lot more information that goes into that and needs to go with that. We have a wireless planning team for large Wi-Fi deployments that can help you to do that and sort of work out those calculations. It really all has to do with how many people do you need to connect to and how fast and what are they gonna be doing once they're connected. And then you can make an assessment about how many access points you need and the density and the requirements. All of these access points support PoE. The faster ones need PoE plus in your switching environment as well. We bundle these very similar to the fireboxes. So we have three different ways that we bundle these with subscriptions. The first is what we would call basic Wi-Fi. All of our access points support basic Wi-Fi, but basic Wi-Fi is not what we're here to discuss today. What we're here to discuss today is the cloud Wi-Fi solution. So basic Wi-Fi, you must have 
a WatchGuard Firebox network UTM appliance in order to manage these. And the Firebox becomes the management or the controller for these access points. It's very limited in its capabilities in the sense that it doesn't do any of the whips that we're here to talk about. You cannot implement a trusted wireless environment. It's great for a, a very small network. You have a firebox and you might need two APs. You could use the gateway wireless controller. Our recommendation, however, is as a security company, always to move up to that secure Wi-Fi SKU. The secure Wi-Fi SKU that you see on the, the, the screen contains everything you need to cloud manage all of your access points, full cloud management, um, and all of the security features we're going to teach when it comes to, to WIPs when we start configuring up the platform. We then have a concept of total Wi-Fi, same idea as the total security suite on our Fireboxes and that total Wi-Fi includes everything. So you get all of your guest engagement tools, your location-based analytics, and a few other of those features that are great in sort of retail and some different environments. We would really say as a security company, the minimum SKU that you should ever sell these access points with is secure Wi-Fi because there's a lot of holes in wireless technology that haven't been plugged over the years. So having a solution that provides WIPs or wireless intrusion prevention really is important to sort of understand how you, you get this locked down and set up. So what we're doing is we're really targeting six known Wi-Fi threat categories, you know, that sort of that there is six primary sort of threat vectors that we'll, we'll talk about when it comes to our WIP. So the first is an evil twin access point. The idea of an evil twin access point is somebody lures users to connect to you so that they can spy on your traffic. So they'll spin up uh, an access point. They might give it a... a uh, SSID such as Qantas free Wi-Fi and your devices may automatically connect to that and then they can do a, a man in the middle style attack and sort of track the traffic and, and where you're going and get some information that way. Number two is misconfigured access points. Basically, you know, when you're rolling out networks that aren't cloud managed and you've got different controllers, different environments, it's very easy to misconfigure some of your access points. So in that case, it opens up your network to threats that you may not have understood. You could have an access point at the back of the factory that doesn't have any security on it. It could be open and it takes you a long time to realize that. So we can stop people connecting Let's say they're moving around your organisation and you've got a misconfigured access point out the back. Our WIPS technology can stop any clients connecting to that and then stop anyone connecting to an open network that you might have in your environment. The next threat that we mitigate is rogue access points. So this allows, you know, uh, essentially at, um, attackers or even your own people in your organisation to bypass perimeter security. An example of a rogue access point could be a mobile phone hotspot, for instance. Uh, somebody could, you know, they're sitting on their computer, they're going through a WatchGuard Firebox firewall, they try and download a, a file and they get a block page. There's not a lot in most network environments to stop people from spinning up a hotspot on their phone, connecting their laptop, pulling down that threat and then connecting back into the corporate environment, thinking that they've done nothing too bad, but they could have circumvented perimeter security and found themselves with a piece of malware and then hop back onto your corporate network. So that's one form of rogue access point. The other form of rogue access point could be somebody trying to get into your network, they come in or they think they can provide better wireless than you, so they'll take a, an access point from home plug a Cat5 cable in the back of it and just connect to this because their Wi-Fi experience is not great in the corporation. So we can stop that behaviour as well. <clears throat> Rogue clients are obviously, you know, that's another sort of form of, of your hotspot or a different device that's floating around the network that, you know, is trying to trick your corporate laptops to connect to a different client rather than access point. It could be client-to-client um, -client communications and, and these sorts of things. So we can, we can mitigate those as well. And then neighbouring access points is also a big one. So if you're in a high density high rise or you're in an office that has a cafe down below that um, essentially is providing free Wi-Fi, 
the same thing might happen. Someone might get a block page on their um, corporate network and think, I'll just hop onto the free cafe wireless downstairs and then I'll be able to download that file. So what the system will do is it really makes sure that your client devices can only connect to a you know, a corporate Wi-Fi network that you allow them. You can essentially think of WIPs of write, as writing firewall policies for the airspace. So my firewall policy, if I had this access point broadcasting my corporate SSID, my firewall policy will essentially say, Pete's corporate laptop can connect to this access point broadcasting our corporate SSID, <laughs> but it cannot connect to the downstairs cafe wireless where um, somebody is offering free Wi-Fi because this is a Cisco device, not a watch guard. It's broadcasting a different SSID. And even if that's external, the WIPS technology will stop the client from connecting to it without interfering with the cafe's wireless downstairs. That's a key point as to the technology that we have. A lot of other vendors will try and knock out this access point. And that's obviously illegal because you can't knock out an external access point that you have no control over. And then ad hoc connections, so peer-to-peer -peer sort of connections. If somebody wants to, you know, send a file to somebody else, these laptops can connect into other laptops and do a peer-to-peer -peer connection. We can stop that as well. We can see that two client devices are talking to each other that shouldn't, and we can do essentially a denial of service on that traffic. <coughs> So as I said before, there's two ways that this product um, can operate. You can have a full WatchGuard wireless network, in which case you have your WIP sensors included in either, you know, an additional AP125, or in the case of the AP420, it has a, a built-in third WIPs radio. So in an all WatchGuard network, it's not a problem. Your, your WIP sensor is part of the network. It fully understands, you know, what is a valid uh, SSID for your corporation. It knows the clients that belong to your corporation because they're connecting to your SSID. So everything just automatically, we have an automatic wireless intrusion prevention in that case. The second option I spoke about before is what we call our WIPs overlay. So that's where we can use the AP125 to perform the WIX function for any of these other vendors. And it doesn't have to be the four vendors that are listed here. It can be any vendor that we have that has Wi-Fi. The only thing you need to do to turn that on is you can configure this device so that it doesn't broadcast any SSIDs at all. It's not used for client traffic. It is literally just a WIP sensor monitoring the airspace for violations of the policy. So in this case, this WIP sensor might be protecting this Cisco access point that I have here. And then if my client is happy, we're happy for it to connect to this Cisco access point, WIPS is not going to get involved. But if this client connects to a personal hotspot, this WIP sensor is going to cut that connection out because that is a violation of the corporate policy. It's very easy to configure the WIP sensor. Really, all you need to do is go into our platform, configure this as a dedicated WIP sensor, and then tell us which are your access points and which are your SSIDs. And once you've done that, the WIP sensor knows what it's looking for and then kicks in if there's any violations of the policy. <clears throat> so how well does WIPs perform? And this is where WatchGuard really has the market wrapped up. <clears throat> this, is, this table you see in front of you now is a, a third party table. Uh, we've got some third party testing done by a testing organization called Mircom. And we tested it up against the Ruba, Meraki, and Ruckus. All of these vendors, they do say that they have WIPs technology, but we have some very sophisticated patents in ours that really allows it to be market leading. So this, this is, you know, we can sort of see here all the things, the six major threats that we tested, rogue AP, rogue client, neighbor AP, ad hoc network, evil twin, misconfigured, and even sort of concurrent threats as well. And then we worked out, um, can we detect them? Because when it whips and wireless prevention or wireless intrusion prevention, detection and prevention are, are very different things. And the way you mitigate all of these attacks is quite different. Some are done on the wired side of the network. Some are done over the airspace. So the first thing we did is we worked out 
can our access points versus the other vendors detect the threats? And WatchGuard passed all of them, and you can see from the other vendors they had varying degrees of efficiency. The difficult piece of the puzzle with wireless intrusion prevention systems is being able to automatically prevent it. You need to have very, very clear classification. If this is an access point, as I said, that's completely external to your company, you can't interfere with this access point. That's highly illegal. And, and in some countries, there, there are big fines for doing that. So that automatic prevention and detection really comes to the, the really what makes that work is the correct and accurate automatic classification of what is an external access point, what is a rogue access point, what is a misconfigured access point, and so on and so on. So this, this table really speaks for itself. In some of the other instances will even tell you that you really need to know what you're doing and warn you against turning on their WIPs environment, whereas at WatchGuard, we, we don't want you to roll out these networks without having WIPs turned on because it works and the classification is fantastic. So with that, I think we'll dive right into the platform. This is not a 100% kind of configure from the ground up training. Um, we do have other training and masterclasses recorded for you. So we'll go into the platform um, and I'll sort of show you how you configure it um, enough so that you can you get an understanding of, of what it does. Um, if you're interested in how you activate access points, how you get them into the portal um, and the first piece of the puzzle, will direct you to the ANZ recording from the last masterclass that we ran. So if you, you may or may not currently sell WatchGuard um, access points. So if you do, you're probably familiar with how to get into the portal. If you don't, you may not understand how to get into the portal. But as I said before, just because you may look at other vendors or you you already got some clients with other vendors, what I'm telling you today about the WIPs can be rolled out in those scenarios. So the WatchGuard wireless platform really has what we call sort of five key applications, discover, manage, analyze, engage, and go. What we're training on today is the discover piece. So that's going to allow us to discover what's happening in the wireless environment and also configure a trusted wireless environment in sort of two formats. We'll go through how you configure um, you know, broadcast and SSID and protect things and we'll also talk about how you look at what's happening with the, the classifications. So the discover platform the, the other pieces of the puzzle, they provide different some analytics and some reporting, um, some easy first setup in terms of Go and these sorts of environments. But everything we'll do today is in this Discover platform. Matt, if there's anything you would like to add before we get started, please feel free to jump in at any time. The WatchGuard Wireless is really built to be able to, for managed service providers to be able to manage multiple wireless environments. So what I have in front of me here is our normal WatchGuard account. And if I have a look at the top locations, you'll see that we have a number of different locations available to us. These locations, some of them are, are my home office, obviously with the COVID crisis we're dealing with at the moment, everybody's working from home. So we've all got home Wi-Fi. Um, there's the ANZ Australia office. So we've all got our, our wireless system sort of configured in here. But the beautiful thing I love about Discover, the first thing we're going to go through is how we can use Discover to troubleshoot some wireless performance issues. And when I say wireless performance issues, it's not that the product underperforms, it's just that there is so many different places where wireless can have performance issues. Those can be contention in the airspace, it can be people not knowing the passwords, it can even be down to the network level. So I can see straight away from this screen that we have 36 clients um, that have tried to connect to the network. 36 of them associated, so that's at the association sort of level, so that low level wireless stuff, so that's great. They've all associated, but then somebody's gone to authenticate and they've had an issue. So straight away, if I was managing a group of wireless environments, I can see here that we've had a handshake failure, failure and one client has failed to authenticate. And I can click through in this case, and I can see that the client name, 
um, and I can find information about what's gone on in terms of the location, which access point they were connected to. So straight away, we can know that somebody's not connected to the, the wireless network that has tried to connect. Now, if I was a managed service provider, that would be across all of my client base because that's at the top level location. But generally speaking, most of my clients are online and happy. We can come down and look at clients with the most failed connections. So we can see here that there is a Texas Instrument device at my home that has uh, failed to connect to the Wi-Fi 30 times. Um, this is my Kindle, I believe, uh, which is very old and I just got a new one, so we don't have a problem, but it does have some association problems. And But I can see in here that there's a lot of different failures for this device. So again, if I'm managing a wireless network, I can definitely very quickly pull out what's going on, contact the client and maybe preemptively strike that they've got someone that's trying to connect into their environment and they're having some, some troubles. Everything in this platform is also baselined as well because wireless performance is not perfect um, in terms of somebody might spin up uh, an access point next door utilising the same channel. So it could be perfect today and then it could be a little bit different the next day. So everything that we do inside this Discover platform really goes back to a baseline because you need to understand your baseline performance to then work out when there's deviations. And we can see that at certain times we have more clients affected than others. And that could be uh, got to do with contention. It could have to do with somebody next door doing something different on their wireless. But this platform allows us to look at the baseline and try and establish any patterns when things might, may or may not be working. And then we can see down here that the top locations by failure is actually my home. And that's because of that, there's 30 devices on the, the Texas Instruments. We can also look further into that, however, and start looking at this client journey tells us about whether they're connected, but what about once they're connected? Then we can come into this performance tab and we can see here that we have seven clients affected in what we call our client health category. So lower RSSI, high retry rate and low data rate are three of the primary things that are going to affect your wireless performance. So a, a low RSSI might be that you don't have enough access points and clients are going too far away from one access point before they are connecting to another one because that extra one might not list. So if you've got a lot of these, you might need to know that you automatically need more access points. A high retry rate in wireless might mean that you've got a very noisy environment, your channel selection is not perfect, and you might need to look at your deployment in general. Are your APs placed in the right uh, section? Are your channel selection, auto channel selections working for you properly? And then a low data rate. A low data rate may not be because of the wireless. So this is just clients that are pushing a, a, a data rate that's less than 20 megabits per second. This could be an issue further into your network, but it's important to know this sort of stuff because it might not always be the wireless fault. So someone might call you and they might say, oh, my wireless isn't working properly, but then you come in, have a look that they've got a, a really high DNS latency, for instance. And it might just be the fact that their DNS is not working. So we also track some latencies for other things just to make sure you're not looking in the wrong spot for your, your performance issues. So if I change this to one week, you'll see that I have this baseline and, and this is the baseline for all of the locations we have. And then we have a few deviations from that baseline. So, you know, at different times we get some low RSSIs and we get some low, um, we get some clients with low data rates. So we can investigate a little bit further when we look at this and we can drill down into different uh, SSIDs to see whether it's you know unique to a certain site or whether it's uh, sort of across the board. 
when we're all working from home, we've got different environments. Some of us live in high density areas, so contention will be an issue. Some of us live in low density areas, so it won't be an issue. But you can use this to establish, you know, how your clients are performing. And each of these, you know, you can drill into all of these environments and have a look at which are the clients that have had a low data rate or, a, you know, poor SSID. So some of these, um, you know, some of these I do know are at my house and I could probably do with a, a, an extra AP in here up in the roof down one end of the house. So I do get this sort of low RSSI at different times. We've also got this down here. We'll sort of show you that at this SSI, have a number of, of issues as well. So we can click further into the associated SSID to sort of, are they already filtered on that? So these are all at Seabell's SSID. Now I happen to know this is one of our one of our colleagues who lives in a high density area, who's got a lot of issues with, with very thick concrete walls in, in, the, uh, in the apartment that they're in. And so this does not surprise me that we're seeing some low RSSI in certain areas of, of that location. So we can keep going further further down the, the piece of the puzzle. We can look at who's using the most traffic, who's using the most network over, you know, certain uh, SSIDs over certain date ranges. So there's a lot of data and a lot of power in this platform. But we can also go a little bit further and we can look at application usage across, um, apologies, application usage across the environment as well. So at the moment, we're not seeing any issues, but you can simulate traffic profiles for, sorry, we're having some go-to meeting issues. So I'll show you this in a, in a sec, but you can simulate traffic profiles. So what happens is you can tell one of the third radios that might be configured on an AP325 or an AP420 to hop into client mode and it'll then connect back into the wireless network and it'll simulate some traffic profiles. So it'll run different sort of real-time traffic profiles, Office 365, it'll try to connect to Office 365. And so we can see that we've got two clients that are potentially having um, you know, a poor go-to meeting experience. Now, I get this quite a bit. <clears throat> My internet is not perfect where I am. I'm hoping that it's coming through clear. I did a lot of testing today. Um, but essentially, this is... Um, telling me that my MacBook this morning was having, you know, a, an experience that may not have been good enough for GoToMeeting. And I can see here one of the reasons why. It's because it connected to the shared access point rather than the office access point. So straight away, I can say this MacBook was having a poor experience, but I know why it was connected to the shared access point. And the only reason it connected to the shared access point was because as part of the training process, I had disconnected the access point in the office today. So it associated there and the go-to meeting kept going. So I can work a lot of this out by just looking at this platform health information. And then, <clears throat> We can also obviously monitor our WIPs. So our WIPs environment across all of these sites all drills up and I can start looking at what is happening with the classification in my network. So we'll talk about this further uh, shortly in this WIPs section, but this is how we can very easily get a get a grasp on what is and you know what is happening in our network, whether things are classified correctly from an access point or a client classification, or whether intrusion prevention is currently kicking off any uh, automatic intrusion preventions. <clears throat> you can also, um, under the monitor section, obviously get a lot of data about all of the clients on the network. So in terms of monitoring your Wi-Fi clients, you can find out their IP address, their MAC address, often their OS associated access point, and you can just keep going in terms of their data rate and their average data rate and their retry rate. So when somebody calls you and says, we're having a, a poor performance you know, on our, on our Wi-Fi potentially, you could come in here and um, have a look at that client. You could see a high retry rate and start to investigate why that might be. 
I talk about poor performance, not because Wi-Fi always performs poorly. It's probably the wrong word to use. Correctly deployed, correctly configured, Wi-Fi is absolutely fantastic. We do, however, find that a lot of people feel that you can just place some access points wherever you want and Wi-Fi is done. So that's what the Discover platform is all about, making sure that when you put your access points in place, that things are working correctly. And if they're not, you just go and check your channels, you go and check your deployment, make sure you've got your access points in the right areas. So it's very easy to fix once you have the visibility. People have heard me say a lot on the Firebox or the security side, you can't secure what you can't see. It's the same on the wireless side. You can't provide good performance if you don't know the metrics and the data associated with the retry rate, your RSI and these things. We can monitor our access points. I can straight away here see that I have a couple of access points that need the firmware updated. I can configure this um, for automatic updates if I want. I can check the power source. So <clears throat> something that we find a lot, we get a lot of calls about. Someone goes and buys a, an AP420, for instance, um, and then they plug it into their switching. They haven't done their homework properly. And the AP420 will operate with PoE, but it'll operate in a reduced capacity mode. So it won't be as fast and the performance won't be as good as what you're expecting out of an AP420. So you can come in here and see the power source that's associated. We get a lot of calls about that. And often the fix is just get some PoE injectors, PoE plus injectors, or, or upgrade your, your switches. You can see the associations to each of your access points. Um, there's plenty of information that you can do, and you can drill down into any of these um, access points and then go and have a look, you know, for further information, you know, how much traffic is being produced on, on each access point and so on and so on. So there's network usage data per access point, how many clients are connected. There is just so much power in this platform when it comes to visibility and analytics that you really can you can really provide excellent confidence to your clients that not only have you sold them a Wi-Fi network, but you know what you're doing with Wi-Fi, you take Wi-Fi seriously, and you can obviously you know back that with the data that you need. <clears throat> And this is all the way down to your application visibility. So we can start to look at what traffic are they seeing. They're very similar to what we can do on a, on a firewall. You know, we can look at YouTube, we can look at Facebook, Exchange, SSL. So we also have that sort of application and analytics data. So somebody could turn around and say to you, um, you know, what's happening on my wireless network? And you could click on uh, YouTube and have a look at which you know, what, which traffic, you know, who, who is using YouTube, clients with the most YouTube traffic and, and these kinds of things. It's not surprising to see a lounge room TV there, but, uh, you know, people are obviously, you know, looking at YouTube. A lot of people are at home. So you can drill down into this and see which clients on which sites. And the good thing about this is, as I said, this is all hierarchical. So if I just want to go and click on a different site, I can click on this different site and I'll just see the application visibility just for this site. So there's plenty of ways you can sort of start at that top level and then drill down and work out where where the um, where the traffic is coming from and who the traffic is coming from as well. Then we obviously have in this platform full configuration, which we're about to get into. But we also can, something that I love, um, is the ability to upload our floor plans into the environment. Now, this floor plan is tied to, to my home. This is not my floor plan. This is just a floor plan I found online for to sort of showcase how it works. But... <laughs> You can upload a floor plan for a location and then place your access points uh, on the floor plan as to where they actually correspond in the environment. And you can see, um, you know, at what point 
are you going to sort of get coverage? So we sort of say about minus 75 decibels is, you know, as low as you want to go to be able to stream YouTube. So if this was my real environment and I've just got sort of plaster walls. I might have a bit of a gap in the middle of the house. If So I might need to look and, you know, move my access points. If I moved one of my access points um, or move both of them, I could probably get a, a better complete coverage of my house. So you can use this tool to work out your coverage, your link speed, um, and you can also do some channel coverage as well. So it's a really good thing to be able to, you know, show your clients that, hey, we, we've assessed where we're going to place the access points. And in this case, we think we need to run a cable to a different section um, because you're going to get a better performance out of it. And this is kind of what our wireless planning team do as well. You give them the floor plans, you tell them what the walls are made of, and they will give you a very accurate map about where's the best place to place your access points and how many you're going to need. So really good feature. You know, it's it's not a full spectrum, you know, analysts having, a, it's not a, what we call a site plan for, for Wi-Fi deployment, but it is a very good tool to have in your arsenal just to make sure that everything is as expected in the environment. And then finally, just to sort of, you know, th this is um, some of the features that we have as well. You know, you can troubleshoot, um, you know, wireless connectivity issues. You can do packet traces that you can download from the cloud. Full spectrum analysis is available. So if you're a managed service provider and you've got wireless um, systems all over the country from your engineer from the desk in your office can do live client debugging get the debug logs look at the spectrum analysis of the site to work out whether the channel selection is is correct do a packet trace from your access point and download the wireless um uh the the wire the wire shark trace directly from the access point so plenty of things and tools in here to investigate your wireless from a discovery point of view. We haven't started to look at, you know, the monitoring and the configuring. That's just around, you know, deploying wireless that works is the important thing. And the take home message is read the wireless deployment guide because there's a lot of complexities when it comes to deploying wireless. It's not like plugging in a Cat5 cable. There are some things you need to consider and take a look at, and that's what this platform is enabling you to do. <clears throat> Matt, any comments there before I move on? No, Pete, it's all looking good. Fantastic. So what we want to do is now just sort of show you how you would build out what we're calling a trusted wireless environment. So a trusted wireless environment is an environment that is going to mitigate, automatically mitigate, those six primary threats that we are um, worried about. <laughs> WatchGuard has a very good documentation on building this out. Now, I'm not just going to step you through the documentation, but you <clears throat> should be aware that this document exists because this is from start to finish the settings that you need to adjust to build a trusted wireless environment with WIPs. What I do want to go through is just go back to those six known threats and run you through some of the things that we talk about. So this is a step-by-step -step guide that's going to show you how to build out your wireless environment that's going to automatically mitigate those threats. But there's some good data in here too down the bottom when I find it, apologies, <coughs> that talks about the six threats so that you can talk to your clients or, or understand exactly how the automatic intrusion prevention works. And I think I've missed it. Sorry. <coughs> so here's how, here it is, how the intrusion prevention stops the six known threats. So with rogue protection, rogue access points are unauthorized APs that are physically connected to the authorized network. So in this case, it would be this cafe's wireless that I was pretending to be a cafe's wireless before, physically plugged into the network. Someone could have done this internally. Somebody could have done this as a threat. 
So by default, the intrusion prevention policy stops rogue access protection. But it also does it on the rogue client side as well. So these are clients that connect to a rogue access point. So the, the thought process here is that we can stop the rogue access point, but it's also a good idea to make sure that clients are not connecting to the rogue access point. So rogue clients that are connecting really nearly to rogue access points that might be in your environment, we also stop them to be able to connect to guest APs, to be able to connect to your corporate network as well. For neighbour AP protection, this is an important thing to understand. When I have a, a laptop here, and the first time, the very first time I connect to my corporate SSID, I have a valid set of credentials. So my connection works. At that point in time, the system automatically classifies this laptop here as an authorised client. And once it is an authorised client, it'll stop me associating to different access points that violate the policy. So the defaults are really to say that a client, an authorised client, I have valid set of credentials, so I'm authorised, cannot connect to external access points, rogue access points, or even our guest SSID. You don't want your staff thinking they can connect to the guest SSID for a different browsing experience than on their normal network. <coughs> We also do the, the ad hoc connection, as I said, so it, it stops guests participating in an ad hoc network and rogue clients creating an ad hoc network as well. So there's the two pieces of that puzzle. There's one of your staff members doing something they shouldn't do, but trying it out anyway, but then there's also an attacker or a threat actor that might be trying to trick people to connect into to their own you know, client. And then we've got some evil twin access points. So, you know, we've got some Mac spoofing. If somebody gets a hold of the MAC address of one of your access points, a lot of other vendors just do this sort of evil twin protection by a MAC address. We've got the ability to check for spoofed MAC addresses. So if somebody is trying to pretend to be a WatchGuard access point at that MAC address level, we can obviously detect that as well. So all of this is pretty much done out of the box. There's one or two settings that you need to change to create this trusted this trusted wireless environment. And this documentation is fantastic. It's so simple to follow. Any engineer that has done any wireless before would be able to just follow this document through and create a trusted wireless environment. So what we're going to do now is I've created a new folder or a new location for this, uh, this test that we're doing today. And if I go to monitor Wi-Fi, just so you're, you're aware of sort of what I've done in the first point of the puzzle, I've actually moved an access point into this location. So to move an access point, you literally just click on the, the hamburger and select move and you move it to a different location. When you first activate an access point, it's gonna go into the staging area and then you move the location that it's going. So this is the access point that's in my office. It's online and it is up to date. But this site doesn't have any um, configuration because I haven't configured the wireless at this point. So the first piece of the puzzle to building out a trusted wireless environment is to configure a wireless SSID. That's generally the first thing that happens in, in most environments. So I'll just call this masterclass. Down here, it's a, a private or a guest SSID type. Now, the reason we have this different type is because the private is our corporate networks and the guest is obviously our guest networks. But that helps us when we have the WIPs policy in place that says this is an authorised laptop it can't connect to guest external. It can only connect to these private SSIDs. I'll set up some security on this. Um, and I'm just going to keep very basic settings in, in this sort of environment. I can do some layer two traffic uh, filtering and inspection. 
that's uh, okay on the AP325s and the AP420s. We don't recommend on the AP125s ticking this box just because they don't quite have the grunt to do that inspection. You can do it. It's just that you might not get the, the throughput and client association numbers that you'd expect out of that access point. So we're just going to save this and turn the SSID on. Now, we're a security company. I would never recommend in a corporate environment having a single pre-shared key for a corporate network. 95% of corporate networks um, use a single pre-shared key. You must, if you take security seriously, implement radius single radius sign on into your wireless environment because then if you go and somebody leaves the company you disable their ad credentials and lo and behold you've disabled their access to the wireless as well so this is telling me which bands do i want this 2.4 and 5 so i'm just going to turn the ssid on for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz so I've just gone and created a SSID that is associated at this site. <coughs> so under my wireless masterclass here, I need to assign the access points to this um, or the radios to this SSID essentially. And I believe that is done under the sorry. Sorry, Matt. Just uh, the new discover UI associating the SSID. Uh, sorry, I was answering questions. Associating the SSID, what, with an access point? With the device, yeah, under the new UI. So I've got the, the SSID, I've built it. I have the device in the, in the folder. Yep. And then I want to turn the SSID on for that device. Uh, it's just a matter of just once you've turned it on, if it's in that folder, it would automatically apply to that device. Right, yeah, okay, cool. So, and the Wi Fi might take a second to, to do that. Configure Wi Fi. Uh, okay, yeah, no, that's good. So, just probably will take a second to update that device. The access point, the office. The SSIDs that it is broadcasting under here. So it's still broadcasting my old SSIDs from when I moved the device. So I need to associate this device with the access point. So why is that not doing that already? Apologies. Configure, wireless. I've built out my SSID to my radio settings automatically. Everything's good in there. My device settings, so it's not a dedicated WIP sensor. I don't want to configure it for the environment. Masterclass, security. Looks all good. Okay, ha have you saved the policy? Yeah, I have. Good. It says here it may take some time to take effect on the access point. So I'm just looking at the access point now up on the roof. It's got an orange light, so it is doing something. So we'll just give it a second. And there we go. <clears throat> just took a little bit of time. So... In the uh, older UI, we used to have to associate the SSID. That now happens automatically. So it's now got one access point and it's got a 2.4 and a 5 gigahertz SSID. 
So if we now were to look at our monitor, our Wi-Fi access points for this location, we'll see that the office, if we scroll across, the SSIDs are multiple and it should be broadcasting the masterclass SSID. So that is exactly what we wanted to see. So that is our basic wireless setup, but we haven't gone and enabled WIPs on this environment. So in order to turn on WIPs, we need to go and set up a few things. The first thing we need to do is create what we call an authorised Wi-Fi policy. So we create an authorised Wi-Fi policy because we need to know what SSIDs that this location is allowed to broadcast and really what vendors are allowed to broadcast that SSID. So we're going to go and create an authorised Wi-Fi policy called Masterclass. It's not a guest SSID and the authorised SSID is Masterclass. Now you can get as granular as you want. You can say that this uh, SSID can only be broadcasted on 2.4 and not 5 gigahertz. The more granular you go here, obviously the more, um, you know, the more hardened your security posture is. We'll just go and uh, do this in a simple form at this point. So we're going to say that only WatchGuard access points or only WatchGuard um, APs are allowed to broadcast this and the authorised, um, the SSID must equal masterclass. <laughs> Once we've created our authorised policy, we then need to go and make some changes to the WIPs configuration. So inside the access point automatic configuration, WIPs access point, the defaults here are okay. So we're saying automatically classify external access points that are uncategorised as external. So once we know they're external, classify them as external. And then automatically classify rogue access points you know, as rogue. So that's all good. We can um, leave the defaults there. That is fine. For our client auto classification, this is the only place we need to make a, uh, a change from the default. So in my case, I'm just going to come down. Um, and it's important to understand that a lot of this can be inherited from top level locations. So it says down here, editing this configuration is disabled because it's inherited from the locations. Now, I don't want to go and affect all of the other sites, so I'm just going to break the inheritance so I can make some changes to this policy. I'll restore the defaults. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to show you that you can restore the default so that the guide, if you've played with these settings, the guide will make sense. And then what we really want to do, there's two changes to make here, is to say reclassify external clients as authorised and reclassify guest clients as authorised. So what this is saying is that if a client automatically connects to an authorised access point, which is an access point that we as administrators have said is okay, or that the system knows about and adheres to that authorised wireless LAN policy, then once they've got a valid set of credentials and connected, reclassify them as authorised. We'll save that. And then in terms of the WIPs, the main last thing that you need to turn on for a standard environment is to turn on automatic intrusion prevention. Now, in our case, it is on because I preset this up, but <clears throat> if I... Uh, break the inheritance on this and I restore the defaults. I can then adjust this and deactivate it. Now I'm going to leave it on in this case, um, but this will go and then, you know, I can turn it off and this is essentially, actually I'll turn it off at this point and save this. So WIPS is now configured for this site, but it's not saved essentially <clears throat> but it's not turned on the automatic uh, whips now this doesn't stop the classification so classification will still occur we'll still mark things as rogue external and these sorts of things 
but the automatic prevention will be disabled until we turn it on. <clears throat> the last thing that I would always do and I would encourage anyone to do when building out one of these environments is to add another SSID policy, that is the guest wireless. And then you specify this as a guest environment. Now, I'm not going to put security on this at this point because it's a guest network. You can add a captive portal to it. You can do whatever you'd like to do. Um, unlikely where I am that anyone's going to connect in the next 15 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to turn that SSID on for both the 2.4 and the 5. And then I have an environment where I can connect into this and then try and connect to the, the guest and sort of show that the WIPS is, is doing what it's doing. So I've gone and created an SSID for my corporate users. I've created a guest SSID for my guest users. Um, I'm broadcasting both those SSIDs and I've configured the WIPS to mitigate those six Wi-Fi threats. And that was really just by creating the SSIDs and changing two settings out of our default. I haven't turned automatic intrusion prevention on at this point in time. Just I need to be a little bit uh, careful how I do it in this lab environment. I don't want to kick myself off uh, the network. In a normal environment, um, we want WIPS to, to be automatic and on. But given I'm giving a, a presentation, need to make sure that everything is classified correctly before I, I turn that on. So if we want to look at the classifications of the WIPS environment, we can come under monitor and monitor our WIPS for this location. So the WIPS is showing me that I have one access point, one managed device. It's my office access point. If I click on access points, this is the other access points that are in vicinity of this often office access point. So you can see there that listed is Cisco, and this is the Cisco access point that it's talking about. So if I click on the office access point, you can you know, drill into more data through that Discover platform for that office access point. It all sort of goes back to the, the right locations. Um, this Cisco access point is classified as external. So if we look at the classification, the automatic classification for the Cisco access point, it is um external because it's not plugged into our network it is external there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and you'll notice that the a for authorized that is our access point on the roof in the office so it is authorized if we click on the clients that this is seeing it's not seeing any clients in this environment so i can grab my phone here and connect into the masterclass network. And I'll now have an active client in this environment. Might take a second or two to show up, but I can see that my iPhone has connected to that and it is classified as authorization. So remember, what we're trying to get people to sort of understand is that this automatic classification is what's important. So this Cisco is classified as external. That's what we want it connected to. This uh, client here is connected as authorized, and that's what we want it connected to. If I was to get another client, for instance, and associate another client with this, I won't do that with the risk of disconnecting my session, I would see that client as external because it would be an external client connecting to an external SSID. <laughs> this then, if I come in here and I go into my dashboard for WIPs, <coughs> at this Wi-Fi masterclass level, it's telling me that my environment is secure, 
because it's not seeing any rogue access points. It's not um, seeing, yeah, everything is good. I've got authorized clients and I've got external um, access points. And that's generally what you would see in a normal environment. Now, from here, I can activate the WIPs, the automatic intrusion prevention. So I can turn it on. And at the moment, there's, there's nothing that it should be, um, there's nothing that the system really needs to go and do. So down here under my intrusion prevention status, under access point or clients, this is telling me, is the WIPS component of this access point either knocking out an access point or is it knocking out a client at, at any time? And at the moment, our system status is secure. I'll just give that a second to update the access point and I'll show you what happens now if I go to my top level location. If I go to my top level location, remember this includes my house, our office, um, Matt's house, you know, a lot of our staff houses, you'll see that the system is vulnerable and we have six security alerts within this network. So I can click on those six security alerts and have a look that we've got authorized clients connecting to unauthorized access points. We've got rogue clients. We've got a number of different things that are causing issues in, in this network. If I click over here, I can see there's two rogue clients and this is for the top level location. And these are both online and they are considered rogue. So we'd have to go and talk to uh, one of our other colleagues, uh, he needs to do some uh, better configuration in the wireless network and, and Matt and I will help him out because he shouldn't have rogue clients. He's obviously got people that are using hotspots and these sorts of things in the network. So could be his children trying to circumvent some of the WatchGuard security that we have implemented. You, you just don't know. And he may not have the automatic intrusion prevention on at his site. So plenty of data in here, and it's just about this classification, remember, that we're, we're trying to do. So if I go back to the Wi-Fi Masterclass, I've turned automatic intrusion prevention on. And now I have a, on my phone here, I have a Masterclass guest network. Now I can connect to the guest network because it is open. And let's see, this should, because my client is authorised, whoops, leave, we'll kick in and stop that connection coming into the authorised guest. In terms of the Wi-Fi masterclass, I'm external, I'm authorised. So I haven't actually been able to connect to that guest and I'm now a misbehaving client connected to a guest AP. So this is going to disconnect me from this network until I connect back in to my masterclass network. I wouldn't be able to do any traffic on there. And until I get back into the normal network, the normal masterclass network, and then I'll obviously have the ability to you know, do my, my traffic as per normal. The other thing that I can do um, within this uh, WIPs under my monitor WIPs section, <laughs> under the access points, we have the ability, you know, in, in order to make this to, to make this sort of work in a in a lab environment and, and in a training environment, I have to do a few things and change some of the, the automatic classification. But I can come in and change the classification of different devices to rogue. So I could come in here and, and plug in my Cisco access point. into my wired network. So this uh, Cisco access point is now broadcasting an SSID called Cisco data that is not part of the authorised wireless plant LAN policy for the, um, that I configured on my AP325. And automatic, if I have 
change the classification prior to, to this training just to make things work a bit nicer, this would automatically change it to a rogue access point and stop on the wired side, it would actually stop any traffic coming from this access point into, into my network. So essentially that process would kick off the AP, I've just manually reclassified it for, for this training, but it would be considered rogue. And then the prevention status here is in progress. And what that's doing is some ARP poisoning on the wired side. So even if clients connected to this, the um, on the switch side, this access point here in the office on the roof is actually doing some art poisoning to stop this. It essentially renders this device useless. And until you go and you know disconnect this, that art poisoning is just going to continue to keep on going. And I would render any connections to this access point in my organisation uh, essentially redundant. So if I come back to my Wix dashboard at this point, you'll see here that my system is vulnerable. Um, I have one live security alert for a rogue access point. And down here, I have one in progress intrusion prevention status. So this all kicks off automatically in a non-lab network. Um, where you don't have sort of different watch guard wireless systems in, in the environment. Um, and it will just naturally do what it does, whether it's a client disconnection or whether it is a um, access point disconnection. And essentially it does it a few different ways. In this case, it's doing art poisoning on the wired side. If it was a client, it would be doing deauthentication attacks at that point in time. What I've showed you now in this case is, you know, a network that has, um, you know, a very limited sort of visibility into different, different environments. So we can look at different locations if we were to look, for instance, at, um, <coughs> we were to look at, at our uh, head office or WashGuard Sydney office. There's nobody in there at the moment. Actually, it's probably not going to be because there's nobody in there. So that's not a good, um, good environment. We can look at uh, <coughs> monitor oh, the glimpse. Look at look at my house. Your house, you got a bit there, Matt. Yeah. Do you? So Matt's got a little bit of interference where where he is, right? So, oh uh, yeah, certainly do. So. The green ones, the authorised ones, are Matt's devices. So Matt, in this case, has a couple of different devices, but he's also looks like he's manually authorised um, another vendor's access point, a Roku, it's a little TV box, I believe, um, so that people can connect to that Roku without the WIPs interfering it. So that's kind of what we'll talk about now in the, in the WIPs overlay uh, component. So he can see 23 access points and you don't want to do anything to those external ones and he can see a lot of clients as well. So a lot of these external clients and external access points, we can't do any WIPs functionality over the top of. So it's just these authorised or rogue clients. External, we just make sure that authorised can't connect to external. So it really is that simple to configure the, the WIPs environment out of the box with, with these access points. You can configure your SSID, configure a guest SSID. You make two changes to the um, WIPs, um, WIPs configuration in the client auto classification, and then you turn on automatic prevention and you're, you're good to go. The other thing, however, I was talking about before is we do have the ability to, you know, I might have uh, a Cisco wireless network, we'll use my trusty friend here, um, that is my valid wireless network. So we want to configure what is called WIPs overlay, essentially, and that's where you take these AP125s um, and you don't have any SSIDs connected to your network. So um, in order to configure that, it really is super simple. We'll go back to my Wi-Fi Masterclass site, just because there's not a lot of noise in there. We only see a couple of different things. Um, but the configuration for that, if I come into my Wi-Fi config, 
in this case, I'll just delete these SSIDs because remember, it's a WIPS overlay. There is no SSIDs. You don't have any SSIDs when you're using WIPS overlay. I just want the access point in here that's on the roof um, to be able to do that WIPS component for this Cisco access point. So in order to do that, I've got a fresh site here. I've got Wi-Fi Masterclass. I've got one access point associated with this folder. I simply come into Device Settings and I turn the access points in this folder into dedicated WIPS sensors. So there's no SSIDs being broadcast. You cannot connect to this um, access point. And this just takes all of the APs in this environment and says, you are now a dedicated WIP sensor. And I can see this icon here that shows that it's uh, a dedicated WIP sensor. It tells me that devices using the configuration at the selected location are dedicated WIP sensors. SSIDs can only be turned on when devices operate as access points. So it's as simple as turning that on for the WIPs overlay. You give it, <coughs> excuse me, and give it a little bit of time to obviously update the access point. And this access point is now in what we call a, a WIPs only or a WIPs overlay mode. So the first thing in that case you need to do is we have no visibility into the fact that this Cisco access point is a friendly access point. So at the moment, this is... Um, broadcasting uh, an SSID called Cisco data. I can look at that if I click on um, access points. This Cisco access point is essentially rogue. Um, what I would do if I had a fleet of Cisco access points in my network, I would manually come in and change the classification to authorized. So that's all you really need to do. But I, the last piece of the puzzle um, once I've authorized all my access points, this is still broadcasting an SSID called Cisco hyphen data, which is not in my um, authorized wireless LAN policy. So I can see here that it's active and it's misconfigured. And it tells me when I hover over things, that's the beauty of this platform. It says either this SSID is not in any authorized Wi-Fi policy or the authorized Wi-Fi policy for the SSID hasn't been applied. So I need to come into my configure WIPs authorized Wi-Fi policy. See here the masterclass one has been applied, but I need to add a new authorized wireless LAN policy for the SSID that is called Cisco data. Now, in this case, I would need to say that Cisco is allowed to broadcast this SSID, and I might just for good, good sake just put down uh, WatchGuard as well. This is a SRP527. It's a small business device, so hopefully it adheres to the Cisco MAC address policy. Um, we'll have a look. If it doesn't, I'll just take that off rather than look up the vendor. So if I go back to my monitor, my WIPs now, and I look at my access points. Sorry, monitor WIPs for my masterclass location. Configure my fire. Sorry, monitor Wi-Fi. Access points. I have my office access point, so that is connected to our system. But if I look at the WIPs component of it and I look at the access points that are in and around this environment, you'll now notice that this Cisco device is now configured, authorised and is active. So in that case, now it is part of our friendly Wi-Fi environment. So I've done a WIPs overlay. I've got an AP325 on the roof that is going to be doing an overlay function and I can now have clients connect into this access point 
uh, and WIPs won't take control. WIPs won't do anything because it is an authorised and active uh, active device. So again, super simple to roll out a bunch of AP25s. You create the location, you go into the Wi-Fi configuration, and you just tell that location under device settings that these access points are dedicated WIPs sensors. Once they're dedicated WIP sensors and you've created your authorised Wi-Fi policy called Cisco data that matches the, the right vendor and the right data, as I said, you can get as granular as you want. In that case, once you've done that and you start looking at your WIPs, that Cisco is now a friendly access point and we don't have any issues connecting to it. It can connect to my phone or my laptop, could connect to this access point all day, every day. It's only when external access points, which you know we can't see because I don't have any around me, um, would then be a deviation from that policy. So in that case, if I went back to Matt's house, for instance, it's the exact same concept that he's done with this Roku device. This is not a WatchGuard device, but Matt is saying that this is an authorised device in my network and I don't care if my authorised clients connect to that device because I manage that device and I know that it is secure. So the WIPS overlay is a really good story as a way to kind of get security into a wireless network that may not be a WatchGuard wireless network. If you recall, <coughs> if you recall this, um, screen here that I have, if you're, you've got Aruba, Meraki or Ruckus networks, we can just take that security piece and be the entirety of that with a, a small amount of APs. The other thing with WIPs overlay that it's really important to understand is the um, you don't need as many access points. So we say, depending on environment, we say that the density of access points you need, if I had 40 Aruba access points, I would probably need about 10 of these AP125s and it could do WIPs for the whole footprint. And the reason being that a WIP sensor can cover a much larger um, a much larger footprint than a, a normal wireless access point because there's no client traffic. So in terms of having a, a high throughput, you don't need a high throughput. You just need the deauthentication packet to, to get to the client or the AP. So it can cover a much bigger environment. So it's a really good way to augment other networks with uh, WIPs technology. So that takes us pretty much to the end of about an hour and a half. We don't like to keep these masterclasses going for too long because um, these are recorded that you can look back over. But I think the take homes from this, if I just sort of run through some of these, we have multiple access points that are available for you for, for really any sort of environment that you want. Low density, medium density, high density, outdoor with detachable antennas so that you can um, choose the right antenna and then we have a, a wall mount access point as well. They all do just slightly different things um, in terms of how much throughput you can get but I encourage you to look at the WatchGuard wireless deployment guide because you will learn a lot about Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi deployments and there's some great examples about schools and different deployments that you might need to do understanding how the impact of doubling the amount of clients connected to an AP. The AP420 might be able to associate technically 500 clients to it, but what's the performance going to be? And that just depends on the throughput that, that you require. We have different ways to package this. So we have total Wi-Fi, but if you don't need the full analytics and you don't need the guesting, full guest engagement in terms of Facebook integration, LinkedIn integration, <coughs> you can just get the security piece with secure Wi-Fi. The six known Wi-Fi threat categories, you know, these are real world threats. If uh, I'm not a hacker, but if I was and I had to get into a network, everything that I've learned about wireless security since I've worked at WatchGuard, I would probably start with trying to get in via the wireless network. Typically speaking, it is the most wide open area of most business, single pre-shared key, no rogue access point detection or prevention. So it would be the area that most people would start to get in. <coughs> 
And we can obviously do it in a full watch guard network or whips overlay as I've spoken about. So with that, I'd absolutely like to thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Just understand that just the, the lab environment that I'm in and obviously having to keep a, a connection open for this means that uh, I have to do some of those automatic prevention things manually. Um, for partners, you feel free to get an NFR device and play around with this. For customers, you know, you can trial, you know, one access point for a, a WIPS overlay if you've already got Wi-Fi, or you can replace the entire lot with a, 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 you know, a world-class wireless platform that is backed by a, a well-known security vendor. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Um, please, uh, Matt, any comments or questions? We'll probably do a Q Q and a before we um, jump out of that. Is there anything that um, we need to go through before we hang up here? No, Pete, I think you covered that very well. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks, Matt, very much for your help. And to anybody that wants um, you know, any further information about this platform, please don't feel, you know, feel free to reach out to your WatchGuard support, your WatchGuard representative, and we would be more than happy to help. So thank you. Cheers. Bye.